the merger at Pfizer. Please welcome our hero, Danny Gardner. Thanks, Dave. All right, good morning, everyone. I hope you can all hear me. Um, yes, <laughs> I, I did happen to um, have some bad luck on the way here, but I am here, and I arrived here maybe like an hour ago. And so please excuse me, I'm, I'm running on like four hours of sleep the last couple of days, um, but this is what really gets me energized. And so today I'm gonna to be talking to you a little bit more about what we're really kind of deeming today, social intelligence. And I think, you know, for those of you who may not know what that is or wondering what that is, it's really the convergence of a few different disciplines. Everything from big data to analytics, to R&D, to social media, to influencer marketing, there's a ton of different use cases for using social media data. And my team, as part of what's now Halion, uh, has been leading the charge for that, not only at GSK and in the, in the broader company and enterprise, but really across the industry. And so we're really proud to kind of share some insight and a peek behind the curtain today of our journey. And so, as Steve kind of alluded to, this is all actually happening right now. Today we were listed on the London Stock Exchange and soon to be the New York Stock Exchange as a separately owned pure play standalone consumer healthcare company. GSK will continue on as its prescription and vaccine business as new GSK, as we've dubbed it internally. And so you may recognize a lot of our wonderful, beloved household brands. Uh, I'm, I'm a user of many of these myself, you know, so feel free to pick out some of them. And this isn't even all of them. Um, so everything from Sensodyne and Pronamel toothpaste to Tums to Advil, Excedrin. We, we compete in just about every major consumer healthcare category in the world. Uh, but that's enough on Halion. You guys can go check that out for yourselves. There's plenty of press and PR on it. Um, so to really understand where we've been, right, as a really advanced social intelligence team, I think it's really important to understand where we've been, right, and where the journey began. And so I kind of break this down, and it's really easy to summarize, I think, in what we call our social intelligence maturity model, which really is broken down into two different compartments. If you look at the top, there's this building phase, which is where it actually started before me, there were, there were pilots in 2015 and 2017 when I, you know, my team was a part of Pfizer, the legacy Pfizer consumer healthcare business. And we really started to figure out, okay, well, we know that there's an interest in this stuff. We need to determine some kind of use case, right? We want to know what we're going to use this data for, right? We need to explore vendors, and there's a lot of vendors in the space that do a lot of things really, really well. And so that was kind of, you know, in 2018, before I was even hired, you know, there was a Shark Tank competition. It was a whole big thing. It was a lot of fun. And I just missed it. But coming into 2019, we really want to, get to kind of turn the page on this exploratory phase becoming more descriptive, right? And that required hiring an internal expert, and that little bullet represents me, uh, and then onboarding a new vendor. And so I joke, the, the first week that I joined Pfizer, it took me about a week to get a computer. Uh, and so I, I really started with, with nothing. Um, I had a brand new vendor, Meltwater. They're, they're a big global social media company and provider. Um, and so they handed me them. I happened to be using them in my last job. And they said, all right, Danny, wait, wait a week to get your laptop and then get to work. Um, and so that's where, you know, obviously kind of came into COVID, and we'll touch upon this in a little bit too, really accelerated the demand and visibility for what this is for a large enterprise like GSK. I'm not going to read all the bullets here, but in 2020, you know, we really wanted to, at the same time as we were weathering the COVID storm, move to, you know, more of an expansion phase, right? We know this stuff coming out of a 12-month pilot is really valuable. People love this stuff. We're delivering a ton of insights this way. And now in 2021, and now 2022, right, we're kind of moving beyond the COVID space into a more proactive and more prescriptive analytic space. And that's where the real power is in, in using this you know, across the, the 30 brands that we, that we own. This is hard enough to do on one brand, let alone 30. So really, <laughs> early on, we had to demystify, I love this word, uh, what social listening was. Because turns out, people have a lot of different names for what social listening is. Social monitoring, consumer engagement, community management. You know, so we got a lot of that early on from our agencies, who, who were doing fantastic work. But there was a lot of confusion for us internally. Hey, you know, you're socializing all this stuff, but don't we already do it? And so sure enough, you know, I would go on to, to meet with these teams and try to figure out exactly, well, well, what are they doing? Why is there this misconception? And so it turns out a lot of them were pretty much doing you know, consumer engagement, consumer management, which is a really important part of any social media strategy. But these teams typically lack the skill and the bandwidth to run more sophisticated analytics and research more in the earned media space. 
So these were jokingly some of the reactions that, uh, that I had for them. But all in good faith, you know, we, we love our agency partners and we use, we use a lot of different agencies and they all do wonderful work. Um, so then furthermore, you know, social media is really categorized into three buckets when you think about this. And people use this interchangeably, but there's technically a difference between all of them. Social monitoring, which is like the basic collection of information. So if I said to my team, all right, I'm gonna go collect every emergency mentioned that we had in the last week. If any of them are bad, I'm gonna surface them, right? That's monitoring. Social listening is now, okay, well, we're gonna take this a step further. All right, well, how many mentions of Elderberry emergency did I have last week at this time during this activation in this campaign? Right, what does that tell us? They're taking it a little bit step further. And then social intelligence is really the most sophisticated form of what this is. It's basically the collective solutions and tools, the marriage of humans and technology, because the tools can only get you so far, right? They, they help us do a ton of lifting, and there's a ton of data science behind the scenes that gets this done for us. But when it comes to making the decisions and recommendations, that's really where you need a human. So that's just to kind of set the stage uh, for what we're gonna talk about is social listening, social intelligence. Um, and everything um, that we're gonna discuss falls into those two buckets. And so we ran a 12-month pilot. It was really successful. I could spend an hour talking about it. But uh, the really high-level takeaways that we had from this program was that, well, we really have a better understanding of what our value proposition is. And at its core, it's insights, right? We can get to insights faster than anyone else on our team for, for certain cases, many cases, and it's more cost-effective where we can get to these answers and answers that are to questions that we didn't think that we had the answers to. We saw a lot of that during COVID. Informing digital marketing, so everything from paid search, paid social, there's usually some kind of correlative exercise you can run to see how you're performing against you know, earned mentions and people that are basically mentioning you outside of your purview. And so we do a whole lot of that. E-commerce, this is also, I think, not as discussed, as widely discussed in our field, but in, in, in consumer, Right, we sell a lot through Amazon and Walgreens and Rite Aid and CVS. So all those reviews on those sites, some of them are syndicated, some of them are organic. Um, we're able to kind of analyze them in the same, with the same lens. Right? It's all unstructured text. It's all consumer feedback. Really, really important use case that we discovered very early on, which is going to make a huge difference for us in the years to come. And then crisis management. Right? We're trying to protect our online equity. Right? And if we can't see what's being said about us, which was the case when I joined Pfizer, um, you know, then we can't protect the interests of the brand, right? And again, this becomes even more important as we become a standalone company. And arguably most important, we're just more agile. We're a huge, massive enterprise. You know, and we, we already move slow. And so the faster we can become with data that's inherently agile, the more powerful we're gonna be. And the quicker we're gonna get to insights and all the other use cases you saw before. We demonstrated mastery of these different data sources, right? I mean, every single social media and Actually, I haven't updated this. We have access to Twitch. We've talked about that before. We have access to TikTok. Some of it's sampled. Uh, and Pinterest. And so all of these social media sites, they have nuance and complexity, but also opportunities. Right? If you take a look at this Advil post here, no one mentioned Advil. No one mentioned our handle. And of course, we don't own the Advil handle. We own the Advil relief handle. So I always think that's funny. But this is something our tool wouldn't have caught. The best social listening teams in the world wouldn't have caught this unless someone replied or tagged us, and that's what they did here. Because otherwise, this would have passed right by me. Really cool opportunity. Basically, people were describing this, this statue because it looks like li liquid Advil liquid mini gels, Mi uh, you know, liquid gel minis. And so really, really, and it got a ton of engagement. Right, and in consumer, I, I used to do this in the prescription space, OTC gets a lot more engagement, a lot more reach, a lot more mentions. So it's a much different environment coming in and trying to manage all this. Uh, moving into our tech stack, you know, so we basically use two listening tools. I won't go too, too much into the details of why we use two, but they're basically for different use cases and different global teams at a very advanced level. We like them for you know, kind of category level tracking and agile quick turnaround ad hoc reports. This is a glimpse into some of the other tools we use. Business intelligence tools, you know, data science, Google Trends, Excel. Excel's wonderful. I'm sure a lot of people can appreciate that here. Advanced Boolean skills, right? Boolean queries, again, without going into the science, follow a really basic logic of and, or, and not, right? So when we go to run any one of our queries, I think we have like 700 of them, 
they all use some combination of this logic. You'd be amazed at the, just the garbage and the spam that you get on the internet. Maybe that's not so surprising, but it makes it really difficult for us to do our job. And so that's where we've leveraged technologies like this to help weed out this data. Data integrity is, is, is really kind of the linchpin of any type of work in this space. Because if you can't trust the data, all the analytics are useless. Out of the box social listening metrics, a lot of these are really good. They're gold standards, they're very directional, they're easy to interpret. And so we've mastered these and across other social media tools too, not just the ones that I have. And then raw data. You could actually take all the raw data out of these tools, run your own analytics and data science. That's something we do too. So again, demonstrating kind of the mastery of all these different systems and figuring this out all in our first year. And then, uh, and then COVID happened. And so like many, I think all of us appreciate being in the healthcare space, how disruptive this was. And when we think about how disruptive this was, I mean, how disruptive really was it? Well, I can tell you this, everything looked normal at this point in time. And this, this data is through March 3rd, 2020, maybe you know, a couple weeks before the, you know, the country started locking down. Everything was chugging along. These were our benchmarks. We spent a lot of time refining what our query library was and our historical, again, the company had no insight into any of this. They couldn't have told you before our team was, was created how many mentions we had last year and, and through whatever quarter. And then we started looking at the categories, right? Basically all the mentions were, were not mentioned. And so every one of our brands has a corresponding category. Advil's is headache. Turns out a lot of people had headaches during COVID, which was also an election year, 2020. Um, and so, again, I think I made a, <laughs> a note that these aren't to scale, because this next bubble doesn't do this justice, right? We came in and we ran a, a pretty advanced COVID query. I would actually need like six slides stacked on top of each other to show you the proportion of coronavirus mentions only in the U.S. and Canada relative to our brands. I mean, like having to explain this to the 200 person marketing team that I work with, you know, I almost lost context. But, you know, this kind of told us that, hey, people are, are, are more cautious and they care more about what's going on in this uncertain future than our brands. And so that was a real level setting that we had to do early on in the pandemic. And so believe it or not, we actually saw the writing on the wall. Uh, I remember jumping into a huddle room with my director, my VP, and you know, we had just started running our cough cold flu query, right, which is all looking at symptoms and sneezing and right, all the stuff that you, could, you would expect. And we were running it and we said, um, we know COVID is going to be a big deal. It was already getting tons of press in, in, in Europe and in Asia. And so we started seeing that very early on in January. It was already outpacing this, this $2 million figure that we were running through March. That's why I set the context on the first stage. I mean, there's just so much data more data than any social media professional in the history of social media has ever looked at. And then in February, that was kind of it. That's, that's, that's when we knew you know, this was gonna be a very, very serious thing. And so I'm sure you guys probably know what, what came next. Um, you know, I, I get you know, maybe you know, 20 different emails on, on Monday. You know, we're remind you, we're just coming out of our pilot. And so it's like people have you know, awareness of what we do, they trust our data, right? We work really, really hard to, to kind of build our awareness and our brand internally. Um, these are just some funny gifts uh, that I thought you guys would appreciate. Uh, I presented this at another conference online and I couldn't gauge the reaction, so <laughs> thank you those of you that laughed. And so really with the tail end of our 12 month pilot, right, I mean COVID came. So we were doing a ton of social listening around COVID. And you know, sure enough, you know, 12, 12, 15 months later, we were still providing this macro level data that we could tap into. And this is really, really difficult to do. And I was the one leading it, and I've never done social listening around COVID. It was brand new, you know, and so we really kind of tested everything we learned and the expertise that we had internally to figure out, okay, well, we know we're kind of good at social listening. What can we make of this, right? And we have supply chain issues, and people can't get Excedrin because it's out of stock and people can't find it on the shelves. Who's surfacing that stuff? That's our social listening team, intelligence team. So coming out of this, you know, there were, there, we really wanted to kind of level set, right? It was very disruptive, but at the same time, hey, we got to keep the business going. Um, and so we really wanted to focus on three kind of buckets. Key opinion leaders, and we heard a little bit about that today, and they come in different formats, right? They're not just Kim Kardashian, 
I've done a few reports on Kim Kardashian, believe it or not, uh, and the mentions that she's had of our brands. Maybe it was Kylie Jenner. It was a whole bunch of them, pretty much the whole family. And, you know, so there's HCPs, but there's also everyday advocates. We have a great slide coming up that'll show you what that looks like. And they're really hard to find because they don't have 50 million followers, right? And they're not always leading the charge. And sometimes they're hidden. Sometimes they're anonymous. Insights democratization. This is probably a goal for every analytics team in the entire world is to really just refine the degree and the accuracy of information you're putting in the hands of your stakeholders. That's something we wanted to refocus and rekindle uh, a fire on too. And then untapped data, it's everything around TikTok, Clubhouse. There's a lot of different things that constitute social media. There's social media that's coming down the pike that we don't even know is social media yet. And that's part of our kind of evolving role is to keep the company up to date on those different trends. So really the goal of the KOL, when I went you know, to present this internally, we really want to understand our people. Brands are so focused, and not just us, other companies that do this, are very focused on their brands, right? That's the easiest thing to start with. How many brand mentions do I have? But we found that coming out of COVID, we really wanted to focus more so on the people. So we compete in the oral health category, and one of the really powerful social listening cases we use is uh, audience analysis and, on, and analysis of online communities. Excuse me. And this was one of them. We wanted to look at oral surgeons, hygienists. Sure enough, we were finding, uh, you know, dental students, right? They were more active. They're digital natives. They're driving a lot of the conversation. And so there's a whole, there's a whole methodology that goes into that picture. Um, but really cool how we're able to service it and rank it, right? Just being able to organize these people online, it's so difficult. And with social listening tools, we make that possible. Influencer activation, again, we're partnering with people that have their own brands, right? And so that's what we're using to kind of connect with our consumers, right? And influencer marketing, I don't think anyone's perfected it. I think there are companies that do it very well, but it's still very much the Wild West. Really difficult to figure out. I can't tell you how many calls I've gotten, I've received to come and say, hey, you know, we want to do an influencer campaign, but we don't know how to measure it. Because first party analytics, you know, we're tough and they change a lot. You know, and they don't always lead to um, the most uh, actionable recommendations. And then the sentiments of everyday users, right? This is what I was kind of hinting at before. Here's an example of a handle called Chapstick Models from Instagram. They've got 100 followers. And basically what they do is everywhere they travel, they snap a picture of our chapstick, right? These are brand loyalists. And this is just a small example. Every company has, has folks like this. But this was the first time we were really uncovering this for us, a company that markets to 2 billion people every year. Really, really cool. 100 followers, good for them. Insights democratization. Again, this is pretty straightforward. You know, I have a remit of now 30 brands. It's actually more than that because they gave me Canada this year. Um, and so, you know, we were doing a lot of this in Excel. We were doing a lot of this locally. There weren't a lot of systems to support us. Um, I like this spreadsheet. This was a template that we used. But coming into 2021 and beyond, we really need to do a better job with cutting through our analytics. And that came through Power BI. It was kind of a solution we picked up because uh, we didn't have one of the tools I'm going to mention, Synthesio. And so we basically had to throw it all together, as our scrappy team would, and figure out a way to get more than what we're getting out of Excel. So again, we were very, very reactive in 2020. It was really tough. You know, we had to basically you know, go run at 100 miles per hour just to keep our head above the water. Um, but then we kind of moved into this hyper-proactive intelligence approach. Right? We could see more. Right? Now we have an alert system in our meltwater tool. We can set a threshold for when you know, velocity increases or reach increases or anything. There's a ton of customization what this is. And these are being run right now, right as I'm speaking to you. They're being run and refreshed like every five minutes. And if something happens, I know about it. It shoots me an email. And then this is the real game changer for us. This is an advanced social listening tool called Synthesio. They're owned by Ipsos. They're you know, one of the biggest market research houses in the world. And this is a way that we're actually going to put an interactive dashboard in the hands of the you know, four to 500 stakeholders that I have at any given time, and they're going to be able to see what I see and interact with the data in ways they've never been able to interact with it before. And there's, you could do a whole other presentation on how great Synthesio is because it's, again, really helps us democratize access to information across one of the biggest portfolios in the world. Untapped data. This is a good example we pulled from COVID. We saw some chatter. This was in small data. This is a great example of small data versus big data. There weren't a lot of mentions of this, but we started to pick up 
mentions of emergency, and they were price gouging. We have a retailer query, mention all the retailers we work with. So we're running that, right? And we have alerts, right? It's all integrated. Sure enough, we saw that people were selling a box of emergency for $45. That's outrageous. And so this was something that our supply chain team had no insight into, but where we kind of bridged the gap with them, right? We'd never really worked with them before, or with our shopper insights team, or our sales team. And so what we actually found, and this is more, maybe more of an advanced use case, is that we could actually plug this URL back into our tool. This is kind of an advanced social listening operator thing. But if I wanted to run an empty search on all emergency SKUs, some of this was sampled too. Again, whole another presentation. Um, we can pull all that data in, and we're using the same analytics, the same techniques, it's the same platform, at the same cost. Right? So we're delivering all this value on a relatively low fixed cost. That's where the efficiencies are. That's why our ROI has been you know, 300% every single year. And that's how we continue to build the capability. Um, and then I have some, a couple really quick case studies for you. Uh, one is with the brand Preparation H, uh, which is a suppository that we own. If you guys have never heard of Preparation H, Google it discreetly. Um, but this was actually one of the first social listening cases that I worked on, and it was all about finding some kind of consumer stimulus for the brand, right? And so we know that there's mentions around Preparation H. At the same time, we didn't know how many people talked about Preparation H. Um, and so we really wanted to understand, let me pull it all up here. The question was kind of twofold. It started as, you know, our brand manager came to me and was like, hey, you know, we call it Prep H internally. What do our consumers say? Well, we could actually specify to the hyphen, to the space in these social listening tools exactly how they spell it. Turns out they call it Preparation H. That was kind of the overwhelming finding. Uh, but it was really quick, right? I did that in all of maybe like 60 seconds. That's how powerful this is. And then we started to look a little more, you know, working with our agency team, you know, basically the ones who run the handles. I don't run the handles. Um, but we looked beyond that and we found, hey, people actually talk about their, their hemorrhoid purchasing experience, or, or the, you know, the hemorrhoid cream purchasing experience. And so I'm, I'm looking through all the data, and there's these threads about people going off about you know, how, they're gonna, how they're gonna use Preparation H. I'm like, this is like the strangest thing. Mind you, like, again, this is one of the first, first time I'm on this brand, and the first time that I'm doing this work at Pfizer. And it was just, it was really revealing to us and told us, people talk about their offline experiences literally while they're in CVS online. And they talk about it at length. And they have a great sense of humor. People love joking about themselves. They joke about others. This is sentiment we wouldn't have covered any other way. And it's actually a middle of the pack brand in terms of mentions. We get more mentions for Preparation H than we do Centrum, which is a power brand for us. In our resource allocation, Centrum is very high on the priority list. Preparation H isn't. This is a prime example of where, you know, again, social listening isn't one to one with your sales. Um, which takes me into, oh, I got one more. Um, it's basically around macro tracking, right? So that was a brand example, but the teams that are really on the bleeding edge of this are looking even beyond that, right? Their category, they're looking for cultural moments, right? And we thought about, you know, what COVID was, right? We designed a whole bunch of trackers and analytics and stuff to, to basically organize all this data, which was the, kind of the challenge of a lifetime so far. And sure enough, we realized, you know, over oh, the death of George Floyd, this was a very real thing. Our customers didn't care about buying toothpaste. They, they cared about the inequities of America. It was a really, really important thing that we spearheaded for the entire company to give us an idea. Remember how big COVID was? That black line right there, that's how big the spike on social media was when, when George Floyd uh, was, was killed. Um, and so again, this is another just basic takeaway for you guys is that you know, consumers need your brands more than ever, right? And don't forget about the kind of cultural forces that are beyond what you're looking at in your brands what you're looking at in your own handles. There's so much more beyond it. And it's really tough to kind of drill down into all that because that's big data, right? We talked about the small data use case. That's the big data use case. And then here's some takeaways for you. Don't write off your smaller brands. I think I mentioned this before, right? Especially in the prescription space. I know many of you are in the prescription space. I used to work on Entrusto. It was a relatively small brand online that does hundreds of millions of dollars in sales, right? So it's not always one-to-one, -one, right? If you look at any other company, PepsiCo, Starbucks, Right? It's a little different. Everyone's different, but you have to set that baseline. And that's what we continue to do, you know, even three years into this, is that we, we, run, we want to run a new query, or we create a new company called Halion. How many mentions are we gonna have, right? Um, so, so don't write off your smaller brands. Uh, data can be funny. 
Um, be really tactical. Don't be afraid to leave alone what's not broken. We found that we went through a lot of iterations of, of reporting and you know, audience architecture and all these different things. But we knew, looking back, that they worked. There was no reason to change them. So that's one of the big learnings we had over the past years. You know, don't fix what's not broken. And that social media goes far beyond our brands. Danny, that was great. Thank you so That's much. It. Thank you so much. We've got a couple of minutes for questions of Danny. He's going to lead the roundtable in a minute, but anybody have some quick questions for Danny? Yeah. Hi, I'm Stacy DeZeal from Acuity Me, uh, Ads. Hi, Stacey. Uh, my question is, such great insights. Sounds like you guys are looking at this on a pretty regular basis. Yes. How nimble is the marketing team in reacting to what you're sharing with them? And, and are they doing like short sprint plans? around media and messaging to take advantage of the insights you're providing them? They are, and I think you know, the feedback loop is also really important. Really, really tough to do, especially when I consider, you know, I've worked for this company for three years. Right? Our brand manager is on Nexium. Next year is gonna be on, on Sensodyne. Right? And so everyone kind of moves around, so it's really difficult to know who your stakeholders and who your audience, in my role, is. So that's really, really difficult, but we've established a really strong feedback loop with all our marketing teams, because they're the people that own the P&Ls, right? They're, they're the ones that have the most action and authority. They're the decision makers, right? Insights and analytics is part of global marketing, but very much still an enabling function. It won't always be that way, but right now and in our company, it is. Um, so we've actually found that we've been very agile in doing that. Like a lot of the alerts I, sh I showed with you, those are either sent by me in an automated outlook rule, or it's sent directly by the tool. And with Synthesio, the, the advanced tool, it'll be even more streamlined. We just have more customization. And so that's what helps them, and I'm not always in the room, and this is kind of part of our evolution, for what, we, for what they take next, right? This information is valuable to them, but I don't always know what to do with it. And so that's where we've just over time learned, okay, well, we know that you made this decision. What was the outcome? And so that's actually part of the growth plan for us too. It's better understand how we tie this to business outcomes. No company in the world has this perfect, but you know, we like to think that we're kind of spearheading the charge. Because again, we got you know, 30 brands, seven categories, a lot of different use cases, and priorities, objectives, SRAs, budgets, you know, very, very complex, but the feedback loops fundamentally are really, really important just for us to get, remember all those you know, big corpuses of data, information and knowledge out of it, and give it to the people who can make decisions. It sounds so simple when you say it in one sentence, but it's taken years for us to perfect that. And so that's how we've really helped kind of improve agility, turnaround, uh, and just our basic you know, internal feedback loop. Good question. Could, could you tell us a little bit more about the internal organization and your relationship to the brands? Who's doing what? Uh, you're centralizing the listening post, but at the same time, you're democratizing the data through these various dashboards. So who's, where is the insight taking place? Is it taking place ab about individual brands with you, and then you're disseminating them and alerting the individual brands? How does this actually work? Yeah, it's a little bit of both. So sometimes we get requests, and this started very early on. Right, um, we use Excedrin as an example for migraine. I remember sitting down with the Excedrin team and they basically, they, they were starting to do some, some media targeting and they wanted to look at, okay, we know that teachers are a big segment for us that we're, that we're going after, right? They have to deal with kids, they, they, they sit in front of a computer sometimes, you know, whatever the case was. What does that look like on social media? Right? And what, what kind of you know, context can we build around what teachers interact with and what are their pain points specifically versus the broader audience of Excedrin that we look at. So that's an example of where like, the, the brand marketing team, there's about 140 of them, uh, wonderful colleagues, incredibly smart, and <laughs> I basically have to keep track of all of them and all the insights that go to them. Um, so that's an example where they come to me, but oftentimes it's me and the tool, sometimes it kind of happens by chance. And so I'll give you an example of one that's not by chance. So we have the brand Volterran, which we just took through the RX OTC switch program last year. And so, very unique brand for us online. Most of the mentions come from outside the US, which makes sense, because we're outside the US. But um, that's not the case for any other brand we have. Even the global brands, they all focus their mentions, all their mentions come out of the US. But Voltaren was different. And most of their mentions come from Reddit. Pretty much all our, all our mentions come from Twitter. And some of that's you know, skewed for you know, technical reasons and access reasons. Um, but there was also an example, we did a deep dive leading up to that RX to OTC switch. And I remember I was in the data, huge deep dive, ton, ton of social listening and like nitty gritty hands on stuff. And I started to find these small communities on Reddit and there were polar opposites. One was about people who enjoyed knitting and crocheting, right, that suffered from arthritis. The other was a group of mountain climbers and rock climbers 
complete extremes <laughs> when you think of just the day-to-day the -day activities and their beliefs and their interests. And mind you, Reddit is an anonymous site. There's, there's very little that you can kind of surmise beyond their username, what they're talking about, the communities they're in, the upvotes and downvotes that they get. It's so really, really difficult, but we found that community. And that was kind of one of those aha moments where no one expected that. That wasn't part of our targeting, wasn't part of our objectives. It was something we happened to discover. And so that's where I think, just to get back to your question, it's very much twofold, right? There's, there's me kind of you know, in my day-to-day -day setting up the, the infrastructure, really, for what this reporting is, um, running ad hoc reports, and you know, we're involved in campaigns. Right? And so that's where we're kind of in, you know, in the room from day one. We weren't always that way. Right, because we were building the capability as we were feeding the requests. Really difficult thing to do, um, but that's where I think it's very much twofold, and we work in both formats. Danny Godwin, great work. Thank you so much. Thank you.